My name is Kelly Davis. I've been recently um, hired here at the University of Waterloo as the coordinator for the indigenization strategy. And um, I just have a slide somewhere. There it is. <laughs> so um, I was asked to do an opening this morning and to talk about land acknowledgement. So in my language, I'm going to share a small prayer with you all, and then I will reiterate it in English. So first of all, in my language, I want to say, Skeno Seguego Igate Teo Tendok. Nyawago Sengwai Diso Sengwai Gunyohanyo. Ne Deate Nuwadado Ne Ongwe Son A. Eto No Yaduhange Ne Ongwanigora. So in my language, I just said hello to everybody, and I hope everybody's well. And my Ongwe uh, Homwe, or my Haudenosaunee name, is Heyo Tandok, and it means rites of passage. It's the end of the field before the forest. And uh, so anyways, we're taught that our names dictate the way our lives will uh, lay out for us. And I've come to understand that my name ne means that I belong in education, right? <laughs> I'm an educator. I can help people through rites of passage and help them to explore different things, uh, maybe different options to um, go in their lives. So also in my language, in my Kyuga language, I shared uh, a small prayer that my children do every day. And it is, thank you very much, Creator, for giving us things to be thankful for. And it's very powerful. Um, you know, we, we have a very long Thanksgiving address. And I've heard speakers talk for over an hour and a half just to do our Thanksgiving address. Because what it is is it's um, a ceremony. And it's what we use before we do celebrations, before we have meetings before we make decisions. And what happens is a speaker acknowledges everything in creation, from under the ground, on the ground, and above the ground, including the unseen. And he acknowledges what all of those things in creation does for us, for our well-being, constantly. They're always following their original instructions. And as pitiful human beings, are the only ones that don't follow our original instructions. And the reason why we're taught that we're pitiful is because there's four families of the earth. There's the animal kingdom, and the plant life, and the mineral life, and us human beings. And us human beings are the only ones that cannot survive without those other three families. So that's why we're taught we're pitiful. And we need to keep that in mind. That's what keeps us humble, is that we know we have a responsibility to ensure that our environment is healthy. Otherwise, we're at our own demise. <laughs> so, um, so then the last part that I shared um, was in my Mohawk language. And I am traditionally of the Cuga Nation. However, my grandfather, because we're a matrilineal line, I follow mother's, mother's, mother's line. And, but however, my grandfather, he was Mohawk. And so I also acknowledge that when I go to ceremony, sometimes I will honor my grandfather and sit with the Mohawk turtles because that's who he was. So um, in Mohawk, I talked about the people, acknowledging people. And I'm always taught that if we can at least do that, every day to think about the people all around the world. You know, just people, because that's our first family. And we send love and greetings to everybody, because we all contribute to the energy of the world. You know, each individual one of us has an energy field. And whatever we're feeling, whatever we're experiencing, that is what we contribute to everybody else and to the environment. So we always send our best greetings and our love and our appreciation to all people in hopes that they have a beautiful day because then that's going to come back to me and, and we're all going to feel good. <laughs> so, um, so acknowledging people is very important. 
And just acknowledging everybody in this room, we've all come together today to learn about research and to um, experience something together. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Um, I want to talk about the land acknowledgement. I'm trying to be mindful of my time. Um, so there is an acknowledgement, and I just want to talk about why that acknowledgement is important, because I have Indigenous youth that ask me, what is this land acknowledgement about? Why last year nobody was talking about this, and now this year they're talking about land acknowledgement? And, the and our Indigenous youth are looked at like, uh, what's going on here? Why are they talking about your people? And our Indigenous youth are saying, we don't know. <laughs> So anyways, I've taken opportunities to uh, educate them about treaties because that's what land acknowledgement is about. Because all the treaties across this country talk about how do we coexist in this, in, in this land area, right? It's never the mentality of the indigenous population to think about land as ownership. We have a responsibility. That's some good energy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's not about ownership of the land. That's a colonial mentality of ownership of land. As indigenous people, we look at it as a responsibility, a stewardship. We have a responsibility to ensure that our children and our grandchildren have a thriving natural environment to grow in. Right? So the treaties are about relationship. How are we going to live together? How are we going to coexist respectfully with love and appreciation and peace and friendship? So I always teach our youth that that's what land acknowledgement is really about. It's about treaties. So I just wanted to say that part. And I just wanted to acknowledge that this territory that we're on, University of Waterloo is on, is the Haldeman Track. And the Haldeman Track is an agreement made with uh, the British Crown and the Haudenosaunee people, the Six Nations people, to say that um, this space, we're going to give you this protected space, six miles on each side of the Grand River, to live forever in peace and harmony. And unfortunately, we can see that's not the reality today. But that's OK. So as long as we acknowledge that, you know, we have a relationship with the local indigenous communities, and they are the Six Nations, or the Haudenosaunee people of the Six Nations territory, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. So I'm going to give the microphone to somebody. Oh, John. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much indeed for those inspiring introductory comments. We, we appreciate it very much. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I guess it's actually almost good afternoon, but two minutes to 12, still good morning. Uh, my name is John Thompson, and I'm the Associate Vice President of Research here at the University of Waterloo, and also Professor Emeritus in the Department of Biology. And on behalf of uh, President, our President, Farad and Hamda Leper, and also on behalf of Charmaine Dean, our Vice President of Research, it's a singular pleasure for me to welcome all of you, and indeed I'm impressed by the turnout, to welcome all of you to today's research talk, which is entitled Contemporary Indigenous Issues in Canada. And I would also like to thank St. Paul's for allowing us to use this beautiful hall uh, for this event. It is indeed a very impressive room. Well, a little bit about research talks. Research talks are jointly sponsored by the president and by the vice president uh, research. And they are meant to provide an opportunity for all members of the university community, <coughs> students, staff, and faculty, to learn firsthand about the important and exciting research that is taking place here at the University of Waterloo. And today's session um, is in the form of a panel discussion on the topic contemporary and indigenous issues in Canada. And we have four exceptional panelists who will start the session 
by sharing with us some of their thoughts on this topic, each with a brief on the order of five minute presentation. And then they will collectively facilitate an open discussion through Q&A uh, with you people, the audience. So we're going to lead off with Lori Campbell. Lori, could you uh, raise your hand and be recognized, please? <clears throat> Lori is director of the Waterloo Indigenous Student Center at the University of Waterloo. She is of Cree, Métis ancestry from Saskatchewan. Lori has more than 12 years of experience as a director for indigenous in initiatives. She holds two undergraduate degrees, one in native studies and the other in psychology and also a master's degree in adult education from the University of Regina. She is currently working toward a PhD in social justice education through OISE at the University of Toronto. Thank you, Laurie. So following Laurie, she will speak first, and following Laurie, we will then hear from Jasmine Habib. Jasmine, could you raise your hand and be recognized, please? Jasmine is an associate professor of political science here at the University of Waterloo. She uses ethnographic insights and cultural theory to examine questions posed by political scientists. She works extensively with leaders and administrators in EU Ishti, a Cree territory in northern Quebec, to consider not only the role of anthropology in an ever-changing world, but also the extent to which connections can and indeed must be made between historical wrongs and the responsibilities of those privileged by these practices. Professor Habib completed an MA in International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame, and she holds a PhD in Cultural Anthropology from McMaster University. Thank you, Jasmine. So next up will be Dan McCarthy. Dan is associate professor and associate director of undergraduate studies in the School of Environment, Resources, and Sustainability in the Faculty of Environment. He is also interim director of the Waterloo Institute of Social Innovation and Resilience. His research explores the utility of complex systems-based approaches to understanding and intervening in linked social, ecological, and, ep and epistemological systems. Professor McCarthy works closely with several First Nations groups in both Northern and Southern Ontario, as well as with conservation and environmental movement organizations in the greater Toronto area. Thank you, Dan. And then Dan will be followed by Susan Roy. Susan? Uh, Susan is an associate professor in the Department of History her research focuses on the history of indigenous, non-indigenous relationships in Canada, particularly those related to cultural performance, resource and urban development disputes, and political activism. She's currently working as a collaborator on a book that examines the intersections of the Seashelt First Nation genealogies, literacies, and colonial encounters on the Northwest Coast, as well as resource development and cultural property disputes in Ontario, and a history of Indian residential schools managed by the United Church of Canada. Thank you, Susan. So I'm very pleased uh, on your behalf to extend a warm welcome to all of our panelists, to Laurie, to Jasmine, to Dan, and to Susan. Thank you all for taking time away from your busy schedules uh, to join us today. And I now invite Laurie Campbell uh, to give a brief presentation on her experience with Indigenous initiatives. Thank you. Tanse, Nia Nang Maskwa, Nia Two Spirit, Nehi Onitipitiko Sasanasquayo, Nagawi Montreal Lake Treaty 6 Territory, Ocheo. Um, uh, so I've uh, introduced myself in my Cree language. Um, I have uh, shared that my um, 
Uh, mother is from Montreal Lake Cree First Nation in Treaty 6 territory in northern Saskatchewan. And uh, I am I'm very happy to be here. Um, I also uh, want to acknowledge that um, I'm a guest as well in this territory um, and that uh, the indigenous groups in Saskatchewan are um, quite distinct from the indigenous groups that I find myself in the territory that I'm in now. Saskatchewan is home to the uh, Cree, Dene, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis peoples. And uh, I also want to acknowledge and thank Kelly for starting us off today in a good, in a good way and acknowledging the traditional territory that we're on, so thank you for that. For those who don't know me, I am an intergenerational survivor of the Indian residential school system and a child from the 60s scoop generation. I've always known that I was adopted uh, but I didn't, and that I was Indigenous, but I didn't always know uh, who I was, where I came from, or who my people were. My ancestral line was broken because I had been forcibly and intentionally severed from it. I am proud to say that over the last 25 years, I've managed to locate and contact not only my birth mom and immediate family, but all six of my living siblings who were uh, also um, scooped and spread out, then spread out across this country from um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and through to Ontario. And this search that I did was only completed uh, in 2016. I assure you that I have learned firsthand uh, the far-reaching effects of the residential school system. And I can tell you that it's definitely not very pretty. I, I share this because it not only direct, uh, directly affects my daily life, but it also um, affects my career in academia. I completed my first bachelor degree in, it was actually called Indian Studies, that tells you how dated it is. Um, and then I went on to complete another uh, undergraduate degree in psychology. I enrolled in the second bachelor's degree program because I thought, I wanted to continue my learning, but I did not think that Indigenous students went to graduate school. <coughs> It was uh, during the second degree uh, that I encount uh, was encouraged by professors uh, in to come into graduate school. But I was extremely hesitant about that. Not because I thought that I couldn't do it, but because I had several concerns about what my experience might be like as an Indigenous graduate student. My fears of going into grad school were caused by several concerns. Number one, that it would be very likely that I would be the only Indigenous student in the classroom. Number two, that other students would not see who I really was. Number three, that the reality of my lived experience in the areas of study would vary from theirs. And number four, and most significantly, I would have the responsibility to speak of my experiences, which would involve racism and prejudice. And in sharing these experiences, I knew that I would ex also experience pain. Some professors and classmates would not be receptive to my reality. In fact, they may feel targeted. As noted by the late Patricia Montier Agnes, my speaking my reality might be upsetting for my classmates. They may feel personally attacked as they view the sharing of such experiences as somehow ironically causing them hurt. At various times throughout each of my courses, I did experience every one of my fears. I share this story because I have heard from Indigenous graduate and undergraduate students here at the University of Waterloo that this is similar to their current reality. When I was taking my master's, the research course was the one I was probably dreading the most. It was primarily, primarily because the courses in the research area methods that I saw being offered um, didn't seem to hold much meaning for me. But uh, I was lucky enough to have a pivotal pivotal experience, and I found a course called Indigenous Research Methodologies. The calendar description spoke of such concepts as narrative, self-inquiry, storytelling, and it mentioned things like ways of knowing and research as ceremony. The textbook was written by Cree scholar Dr. Sean Wilson and was titled Research is Ceremony, Indigenous Research Methods. The philosophical ways in which I understood knowledge translation and research were validated on those pages. With this experience, I knew that there was a place for me in academia and that I wasn't going to have to leave my indigeneity at the door. What I experience as an Indigenous scholar and what I have heard from Indigenous students here at U Waterloo 
is about how mainstream research methodology wants us to pin down our research topics and descriptions before the research is finished, as though it were static. I see research as a process of coming into being or becoming. It changes as we progress. Mainstream academia tells us that we should decide what we are researching and then do it. It's almost as though you seem to know what you're going to get and how you're going to get there before you even start. But indigenous research methodology reflects that everything is dependent. Everything is related, and it changes, and everything is in constant motion or flux. Universities claim a monopoly on what counts as knowledge. Their very foundation is based upon exclu exclusion of certain knowledges. They have limited views, which are typically confined to the beliefs of the times. For example, positivism reflected the scientific method at the turn of the 20th century. Behaviorism contributed to specialized training during World War II. Liberation theory promised emancipation in the 60s. And for the very daring, postmodernism in anticipation of the new era in the 21st century. Yet indigenous ways of knowing have always existed. They are not limited to any particular dogma or time period. A current issue here at UW is that indigenous students who are introducing new ways find themselves facing a credibility problem among supervisory and peer academics. When indigenous students are drawing on indigenous scholarship, they are being indirectly and sometimes directly asked to validate their indigenous scholarship by non-indigenous scholarship. This in itself is a violent act on our very indigeneity. This is one way in which the institution is still carrying out the exclusionary objectives of its founders. I will conclude by sharing that key to the indigenous research process is seeking nisitatamawin, or understanding. Indigenous methodology involves self-discovery, self-realization, self-validation, and self-disclosure. We understand that we cannot remove ourselves from the world in order to examine it. It involves reflecting upon personal transformation, acknowledging the value of relationality and accountability. Essential to Indigenous research methodology is relevance, reciprocity, respect, and responsibility. We are responsible to all our relations, and our research is ceremony. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you very much for those uh, poignant comments, uh, very much indeed. So next up is uh, Jasmine Habib, who's going to share with us some thoughts and possibly some experiences in engaging in meaningful collaborative research on this subject. Jasmine. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. And thank you as well to um, Kelly for starting us off and to Laurie for putting us in our place, I think. So the much longer title for the uh, talk that I have written out here, because we are on a timeline, is on collaborative research and how our universities may fail us as the community, fail, fail us as well as the communities we work with and alongside of. As the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors and the daughter of a Palestinian refugee, the loss of life, land, and communities that are associated with nationalism, racism, and colonialism have marked my life as an activist, teacher, and researcher and have also shaped my approach to working with Indigenous activists, students, scholars, and community members. Beginning in, the, in Hamilton in the 1980s with the campaign that led to the nonviolent blockade of the Department of National Defense in Ottawa, which had been organized to bring attention to NATO's low-fly test over Inu territory, to the nationwide actions that emerged against the siege of Ganawage and Ganasatage, what we commonly refer to as the Oka Crisis, I came to appreciate as well as to rely on Indigenous community leaders and activists for campaign directions as role models, educators, and experts. In fact, in those years, <clears throat> it was Haudenosaunee students at McMaster University joining forces with community members from Six Nations who helped us all to find our way and who led to the successful mobilization of resources as well as knowledge across community and beyond it, across our own community and beyond it. These moments proved to be hard lessons for some peace activists, as well as academics, who sought often to reclaim their place at the center, even as it was clear where expertise, particularly on how to mobilize nonviolently in opposition to state violence, rested. I have never forgotten this. 
Soon thereafter, the Indigenous Studies program was founded, again as a response to student and faculty mobilization and pressure. It was founded as a center that would take seriously Indigenous practices and relations in Canada and beyond, with Indigenous leaders' engagements from South Africa, the US, Latin and South America, and parts of Europe. I came to each of these experiences as a collaborator, which more often than not meant actively listening, of course, but also ever mindful of what capacity I could bring to the table. When called on, I could write grants and op-eds, design pamphlets and posters, set up media interviews, order takeout, raise money for taxi chits, and so on it went. And I came to them as a scholar. When called upon, I would conduct research, suggest methods for gathering useful data, or discover sites where we might put our energy in order to search for relevant documents. My commitment has led to lifelong friendships and to continued collaboration. Why do I say that the university may fail us? There are a few things I'd like to raise in the short period that I've been assigned. In the course of those initial efforts and since, the work that I do with Indigenous scholars and community members does not appear in all of the many official documents. That is, you will not be able to identify what I do or even with whom simply by looking at my CV. I think it's important work and it's work that's absolutely essential to some. I think it's work that I'm morally responsible for as an academic that works at a public institution but it is not work that is normally recognized as research for that matter. In most cases, you might find it interesting to learn that these sorts of commitments and the labor associated with them are labeled and assessed as part of one's service. What are some of the things I've learned about what it means to conduct meaningful collaborative research? One, placing the community's research interests ahead of your own. Two, ensuring you do no harm. Three, being prepared to drop what you are doing in order to provide assistance, assessment, guidance, your labor. Four, being prepared to listen to community members, both in the words they may speak or write and in their silences. The silence may be telling you more than you're willing to hear, and it may also hold the key to understanding your role. Sometimes, not always, shifting your understanding of yourself as a researcher and allowing yourself to become an expert. Six using all of your faculties of recall. Note-taking may not be an option. Don't assume that everyone thinks of every moment as an ethnographic one, even if that's what you've been trained to do. ORE consent form or Office of Research Ethics consent forms, while important at the outset, are there to protect communities as well as universities. But don't expect community members to want to engage you, to engage with you on those terms. It may take years to get to a point where someone says to you, hey, by the way, where's that form you needed me to sign? And it may take years, and it may be never, for you to be granted permission to share, in any shape or form, what you learned in an interview, at a meeting, or over a meal. I interviewed a number of administrators who have long been engaged in co-governance practices, and those interviewed between 2008 and 2010, and of those interviewed between 2008 and 2010, only two have ever given me permission to share what I've learned from them, and one of them was a journalist. I should also note that in this context, I was interviewing practitioners who were not Indigenous themselves, but I knew then, and I know now, that what they had to share needed to be handled with extreme care. I jointly direct with Professor Emeritus Harvey Fight and Mr. Samuel Gull of Cree First Nation Waswanapi in Northern Quebec, a research and publication project. This is a project that is administered by the Waswanapi Nation Office, not a university or a granting agency. The current project is described by the First Nation staff involved in the proposal as a, quote, long-term undertaking to write, discover, recover, publish, and document the histories and stories of the Waswanapi EU. It is envisaged as, an, as extending over four years, but it is likely to become a decades-long commitment. Both the project itself and the commitments to research and analysis are significant and challenging. This project is unique, for it is surprisingly rare that local historical research in northern communities is framed by the needs of and written by local Indigenous historians, with academic researchers like myself and Harvey contributing specific but also vital research using a dialogic process along the way. The self-reflexive quality of the research is also unusual. In other words, the project itself is the subject of focused attention. 
This is extremely important at a time when collaborative research and co-authorship conducted both by community-based and university-based experts are, when they are acknowledged, often critiqued from diverse political, scholarly, and community perspectives. Such collaborations have rarely been examined in depth ethnographically. My interest in ethnographic writing and analysis in complex relational and historical settings has been vital to developing and completing our group's ongoing research activities. It is important, both in this instance and for academia more generally, that the work involved in creating and fulfilling close collaborations with partners outside academia be fully recognized and credited as a scholarly and research activity that it is. It is also vital that the time horizons needed to work with different partners be recognized and accommodated by the university. In some cases, collaborations with community partners require accelerated research deadlines, which need career recognition even if the type of output is affected. Other cases, especially those involving local and regional institutions, may require much longer than normal academic timelines, both to establish a participant's credibility and to fit local institutional needs and resources. My concern, which emerges from personal experience, is that alternative practices, pedagogical as well as research-based, will continue to, continue to be moved into the margins of what is considered scholarly. The decades of work that it may take to build close and meaningful relationships can never really be measured using the citation or impact factor models that are now in place. And yet, if it's meaningful to us and to those with whom we engage, we know that it's work that not only inspires, but conspires to make things happen on the ground, at the policy level, and in intergenerational ways. We need also to consider that some work will never, <clears throat> sorry, will only ever emerge as meaningful work at the community level and not in the academy, but that it could never have been completed without scholarly intervention, participation, and commitment. I think here of my mentors who have worked among the EU communities in Northern Ontario and Quebec and their predecessors. We need to ask ourselves and the university, what are the effects of research with Indigenous communities when a university's administrative and bureaucratic agenda neglects to account for or even acknowledge measures that are meaningful to our Indigenous friends, collaborators, and inter interlocutors who face enormous social and political challenges? Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you very much indeed for those thought-provoking comments. It's now my pleasure to invite Dan McCarthy to share with us his views and perhaps some of his experience in the context of social and environmental justice and innovation. Dan. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak. Thank you to Kelly. That was fantastic uh, opening um, and uh, for acknowledging the territory um, it is indeed a, a privilege to be here. Um, the, uh, the Anishinaabe and Cree elders that I've had the privilege of working with over the last six or seven years have taught me one thing I should do is acknowledge my privilege, and I try and do that whenever I speak, uh, also acknowledging the territory. Kel Kelly's already done that, thank you. Um, I usually do that by saying that my ancestors, uh, mostly from Ireland, came here in about the 1840s uh, to Turtle Island and uh, because of the uh, Irish potato famine and took advantage of broken treaty promises here and uh, benefited from them, and I continue to benefit from them. Uh, that's a small acknowledgement of, of my privilege. Um, I could go on and on about my privilege as a, you know, a white, cisgendered, male, relatively affluent, educated, um, and, uh, and I think just acknowledging that is a good place to start. I think, uh, like I say, the elders that I've worked with have taught me that. Um, I was, uh, aside from Dan McCarthy, I was given an Anishinaabe spirit name a, a few years ago by an elder from, from Nipissing. It is uh, Nabujigay Nini, uh, which he described, and I'm still working on what this means for me and my work, but he described as uh, sort of one who sees through things. Don't worry, I can't see through anything. Um, and I've also heard uh, from um, someone who knows the language, Anishinaabe Moan, that Jigay is sort of to poke the fire and turn off the hot coals. Um, and so like I say, I'm still working on what that means for me and my work, but I was told that part of my job was to help to, I suppose, translate in some ways um, being a uh, ridiculously 
privileged white kid from southern Ontario that had very little interaction with indigenous people in Canada and virtually no education other than reading about what a pain in the butt Louis Riel was at one point. Um, I, uh, I had no idea, and so I, I want to sort of encourage all of the, you know, potential allies, accomplices in the room that uh, you don't have to know everything. I've actually been sort of accused of or complimented by saying that uh, I'm uh, fearless in my ignorance. <laughs> not sure whether I should take that as a compliment or not, but anyway. Um, in the sense that I... I work with some uh, very patient teachers and elders who have guided me, and I just help them. Uh, and I do what I can, and I bring my gifts to the table and, and uh, rely on them for guidance. Um, I guess one of the things that I did want to say is hopefully in the subsequent one of these, I will be replaced by a young, inspiring Indigenous scholar uh, at this table um, and uh, as part of our Indigenization process here. I think that would be an amazing outcome to begin to develop that critical mass here of Indigenous scholarship to support people like Lori and Kelly in, in their work, so they're not alone. Um, um, in terms of what I've learned in the work that I've done, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I was going to tell you a story of ignorance, but, but Kelly tol told me and reminded me that it's not necessarily a, a story of ignorance, but one of growth, so thank you for that. Um, and, and a few things that I've learned, uh, I think uh, Lori mentioned the sort of the four R's, respect, responsibility, uh, reciprocity, and, and relevance. Um, if you're going to do research as a settler ally, uh, those are some really useful, easy ways to remember that what, you know, how to do what you're doing in a good way. And mostly, frankly, just to listen to the elders or the people that you're working with and actually listen. We don't do that very well. We're not taught to do that as has been alluded to, universities have a tendency to claim a monopoly on knowledge generation. And I can tell you firsthand, as someone who has been trained in university setting and has a PhD, we do not know everything. Um, and uh, we can learn an enormous amount uh, from the people that I've worked with. I can't tell you how they've essentially changed my life and the way that I view the world. Um, I started out my work uh, with <clears throat> NGOs, uh, non-government organizations doing environmental work and environmental justice work and sort of developed a, a capacity for sort of participatory action research or community-based research, listening to my collaborators, developing and co-developing research with them. I realized I didn't start my timer, so somebody just flagged me down and shut me up. I'm really just telling a story here. And that helped me when the call came from a, a senior colleague of mine um, who worked uh, up and down the west coast of James Bay for 20 plus years, first as a dental surgeon looking in the mouths of most of the people up there, um, and then going back and doing a PhD in ecotoxicology. He was sitting in the chief's office at the time and there was a giant stack of documents holding open the chief's door. And uh, Len turned to the chief and said, what the heck is that? And Andrew said, well, that's uh, an environmental assessment of some diamond mine. And I have no idea. I'm dealing with everything from treaty issues to family issues in the community and no you know, municipal, provincial, or federal um, uh, government or agent or, or politician has to deal with that scope of uh, mandate. Uh, he said, if you want to look at it, be my guest, take it away. So uh, Len packed it up and uh, brought it home and handed it to a colleague of mine and I and said, you guys are EAA guys, right? Um, I'm a health researcher. I don't know anything about this. Uh, Andrew's concerned about this. Figure out whether this is a good thing or a bad thing and uh, figure out if they did a good job or not because the EAA was pretty much over. And the argument was from the community that they had not been very well consulted and that's in a key hallmark of any good environmental assessment process. And so we had to look at it from that point of view and went and got permission to do, uh, you know, through the ethics process here and through the community to do some interviews with people and work with the community um, and really just following essentially the, the chiefs and the council and the community's interest in this uh, big project that was on their doorstep and that they felt that they hadn't been, you know, adequately consulted when the consulting firm and the mining company fly in for an afternoon in suits and if you've ever flown into any of these remote communities, anybody 
that flies in with a box of donuts and uh, a suit with fancy shoes. You kind of look at askance, even if you're a white guy out there. Like, what the heck are you doing here, buddy? Um, not surprising, nobody goes out to the consultation, and so that is not meaningful public involvement. Anyway, we looked at this EA through that process, or, or through that uh, research, and uh, found that it was, uh, in many ways, inadequate, uh, not just in terms of consultation. And so, um, again, following uh, the Chief and Council's orders, we um, were asked to teach people in the community about environmental assessment so that by the time the next one came along, that they were better prepared for it. So we spoke to Chief and Council, the Health Unit Education. We even went in and talked to grade 8 students. Imagine trying to keep the attention of grade 8 students when you're talking about environmental assessment. Um, but uh, through that process, then, the community said, well, you know what, we sh really shouldn't wait for the next environmental assessment to come along. We should, you know, engage in community-based land use planning for our traditional territory and have a plan in place. And we thought, well, that makes good sense. And, you know, both of my colleague and I had background in planning as well as environmental assessment. So we, again, helped the community with that. And then the Far North Act came along, which en enabled that along. Anyway, all of that work kind of set me up uh, and, and helped me to understand the concerns of First Nation communities through that process. I realized what I hadn't learned in my education, um, how brutal it was when decision makers, in, even in Toronto, are making decisions on behalf of communities on the west coast of James Bay when it's essentially a, a completely different world, a beautiful world, but a very different world. Um, and that led me to working with uh, a group of elders, and it was totally by happenstance. Uh, some of the elders there call it spirit-driven. On the way up to Fort Albany, you have to stop in Timmins, and sometimes the flights were delayed, and I got to meet some people there and started working with them. And um, that's where I met a number of these elders from sort of Saskatchewan to northern Quebec and started uh, working uh, with them on a, on a project around sort of mine reclamation and using traditional knowledge. And this is really where my my life changed working with these elders, and there are so many stories that I could invoke in terms of what I learned and the, my own biases that I came to face and the inadequacy of my education and uh, the inadequacy of my experience, um, and beginning to then see my own worldview in a very different way. And actually, through my teaching and work with a, an Anishinaabe elder that whose traditional territory uh, this we're on along with the Haldeman Tract and the Haudenosaunee uh, Six Nations uh, traditional territory um, that I met through that Timmins project. He and I have been trying to replicate that experience of uh, giving students an opportunity to encounter uh, a different way of knowing and being and then therefore seeing their own way of knowing and being in a different way. Um, and I, that's been a real privilege to be able to work with uh, students and in, in, in that regard. Um, I'm probably way over my five minutes, so I think I'm just going to stop and I'll answer questions. But um, that work, along with work out on Haida Gwaii, work that I'm now doing with a gentleman by the name of Satsan, who's a, a Wet'suwet'en hereditary chief in terms of trying to look at transitional governance from the Indian Act to the inherent right to self-governance, I've been trying to be and learning to be a good ally and overcoming my ignorance and growing. Um, and I have an enormously long way to go, but uh, I'm very grateful to the teachers that I have, and again, for those budding allies, accomplices in the room, uh, don't let your ignorance and your fear be a barrier. Just listen, be patient, be humble, and remember those four R's of respect, responsibility, reciprocity, uh, and relevance, and if you want to know more about those, I can give you examples later. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for sharing those uh, insights with us. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And I now invite Susan Roy to uh, say a few words about Indigenous histories in Canada. Great. Susan. <clears throat> Great. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, Jasmine, and Dan, for your insightful comments this morning, this afternoon. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the great privilege it is to participate here today, but also uh, the privilege to work with communities uh, on the Northwest Coast and across Canada for the past 20 or so years. And I also, um, Dan just reminded me that I was also uh, honored with an, uh, a name from some Musqueam community members that I work with out on, in Vancouver, which is Quinitum Slani, 
um, which I've never talked about publicly before, but it actually translates as white lady. So it's a little bit of a joke, but it also reminds me of my, my privilege as Queen Eaton's Fanny in terms of doing this work and the ongoing responsibility that I have to those communities. Um, but today I'd like to speak uh, more specifically about um, a current research project, a partnership that I'm just starting to work on. So this is in its very early phases, just an example of a kind of research uh, partnership between Indigenous uh, communities and universities. Um, and also a partnership that really uh, prioritizes and highlights um, Indigenous research priorities in community contexts, especially around uh, Indigenous language revitalization. So this project was initiated by uh, the Cree playwright, playwright Thompson Highway in uh, communities in northern Manitoba. Uh, and Thompson's pictured here in the center. Uh, he is the author of a number of Indigenous classics, The Rez Sisters, Dry Lips, Ought to Move to Kapiskasing. And Thompson was a key player in the emergence of Indigenous the, the Indigenous theatre scene in Canada in the 1980s. Uh, he is a fluent Cree speaker from the Broche First Nation in northern Manitoba, and he was really interested in bringing um, musical performance together with the critical work of language revitalization and resurgence in Cree communities, especially in the communities of northern Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario that have uh, really been facing problems of um, facing epidemics of, of youth suicide. Um, so I started, I was called upon, which I, I really like uh, Jasmine's term, Jasmine's term of being called upon, uh, to work uh, with Thompson and a number of uh, organizational partners to bring together academic community researchers, First Nation partners, Indigenous cultural centers who are really at the forefront of Indigenous language revitalization in the country are really the experts in that work. Um, and also here are a number of our um, uh, individuals working on the project as well. Kim Anderson, who is a Cree Métis historian at the University of Guelph, and David Robertson, who is a Cree writer and graphic novelist, and also the representative of one of our key organizational partners, the Manitoba First Nations Educational Resource Center, uh, which uh, develops uh, digital media and print curriculum for First Nations schools throughout the province. Um, so at the center of this new project is a, a new full-length musical theater piece, which was written uh, by Thompson Highway <coughs> completely in the Cree language. And this piece will be developed over the, over the next uh, three years through engagements in Cree communities in the north of those provinces. Um, so, and also around the performance is a range of different kinds of research activities and projects, including a documentary film, development of school curriculum, podcasts, oral histories, and language lessons that are being built and created by those engagements with youth in those communities. So, so the research that and the work that's taking place in the community really depends on the, the priorities of those uh, First Nations and also um, uh, their concerns and their initiatives. So another aspect of this project uh, relates to Pap Papuan, uh, which translates roughly as laughter, music, uh, love. So Indigenous languages are very funny. And if you've worked with Indigenous communities, you really start to understand the role that humor and love and laughter play in daily uh, work and life. So Highway and um, many elders stress that this is really important because when Indigenous languages become endangered, they are also at risk um, of losing of uh, laughter and joy as well. So this project is also about the revitalization of, of, of Pap Papuan. Um, and the project connects those things, laughter, storytelling, music, and language. So indigenous languages are not just words, they are ways of thinking and being in the world that connect people to place, to their territories, and to their histories. Um, 
indigenous languages worldwide are critically endangered. In 2011, the UN Secretarial, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon reminded us that one indigenous language dies every two weeks. Languages, cultures, and governance systems, uh, which are closely interconnected, have not been lost, but they have been disrupted by policies of dislocation, criminalization, and assimilation. Policies such as the outlaw on ceremonial activities, which was part of the Indian Act until 1951. Policies such as residential school and the 60s scoop, which Laurie spoke about and how it impacted her personally and her community. So these policies have really led to the erasure and invisibility of Indigenous cultures and languages in mainstream Canadian contexts as well. So today in Canada, there are over 83,000 Cree speakers, um, but it still remains threatened by the dominant English media in Northern Canada. Its survival depends on this intergenerational transfer of knowledge. So if children aren't speaking, the language, it can become critically endangered in a single generation. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples stressed that Indigenous peoples have the right to preserve their languages and the urgency of doing so. So I just wanted to just briefly touch upon a, a number of the themes that we've been developing for this project that will also, that are the focus of the performance and the songs, but also the focus of the work that's taking place in the communities um, uh, and the focus of archival uh, oral history and community-based research. So um, these include the effects of Indian Act policies on assimilation and language loss, including the histories of residential schools and day schools the impacts of colonialism on youth and family relationships, the impacts of resource extraction in the North, which Dan has spoken about today. Um, you know, these are key issues that face communities. Um, the relationship between Northern communities and the police and medical regimes. And, and finally, in the orange section there, um, a theme uh, titled uh, Repairing the Circle, Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, and Gendered Violence. So just to show you the kinds of links between the research and the performance, uh, I just wanted to take a little bit closer look at this. This is an image of Helen Betty Osborne, who was a 19-year-old Cree student from Norway House who moved to the PA uh, to attend high school. So in November, on November 12, 1971, she was abducted and then sexually assaulted and brutally killed. Several months later, the RCMP concluded that four white men from the PA, from, from the town, were responsible for her murder. Um, yet it was not until 1987, more than 16 years later, uh, that one of those four a young man was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. So the trial, along with other uh, issues occurring in Manitoba at that time, led to widespread calls for a public inquiry, uh, leading to the Manitoba Justice Inquiry, which concluded in 1991 that the Canadian authorities had failed Betty Osborne, and it criticized the sloppy and racially biased police investigation. But more disturbingly, the inquiry also found that the police had long been aware of white men sexually preying on Indigenous women and girls in the PA, and they did not think that the practice necessitated any, necessitated, necessitated any particular vigilance. So the inquiry concluded that her murder was a racist and sexist act. Uh, Betty Osborne would be alive today had she not been an Aboriginal woman. So I just wanted to conclude today with a short clip of a song uh, that's been uh, written as part of this project. It's called uh, The Lunch. It was performed by Patricia Cano and Thompson Highway at Kerner Hall in Toronto uh, last spring. And I just uh, wanted to show it to you today, just a short clip of it, to highlight the emotional impact of music, performance, and also 
how language and the arts can raise awareness and help to initiate conversations about this colonial history and its ongoing legacy. So these obviously aren't things that we have uh, resolved today in our society. So this song was written as a tribute to Betty Osborne Thompson and his brother Renee actually attended residential school with her and David Robertson, who's working with us on this project, also um, uh, wrote a graphic novel called The Helen Betty Osborne Story. So the song uh, includes a letter uh, written in Cree in which Betty explains to her friends that she won't uh, be able to have lunch with them the following day. So this is about a minute. Quayas, ni me dui di tin, i pinto minta piwitsi mitsu mitta guau, ki guak wapagi, api tali siragi. Quayas, ni na ni ge we pitu tan, adesi di gukkagido isigi itta guau. Ma, ma pam, na ge pitu tan, ma pam, na ge piwitsu mitna guau. Tanegi, Tanegi, a this is a pretty chick, oo new napewak. A this is a pretty chick, oo new oskinigiwak. Tante it to teach, Tante to teach, Tante to go pascatch, Tante to go pascatch, ma. Ma pam kitam kawa pamit na wao. Ma kitam. Ma kitam. Adis iwin peichik u napewak. Igo ti kinach kawitu tagwao. Iwin peichik. Iwin peichik. Igo ti kispin ma nipimitsun wapagi. Iguti anima, iguti anima. Iwin peichik, iwin peichik. Thank you, Susan, and uh, I must say that that song was deeply moving. Thank you for sharing it with us, and thank you for your other comments. Very much appreciated. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we now come to a very important part of this session, and this is an opportunity for you, all of you, to engage in conversation with our panelists. And I would like to thank all of our panelists for having set the stage very effectively indeed. Uh, for the conversation, for the discussion that we're about to have now. I do need to share with you one technical point about the ongoing proceedings, and that is that uh, this session is being recorded, and in order for you, you to, be, to register in that recording when you ask a question or make comments, you need to speak into a microphone. And so Janet Janes from the Office of Research has very kindly agreed to be the bearer of the microphone from person to person uh, as we proceed with the conversation. And I'd like to start that now. Um, I, I, may I suggest that you address <clears throat> comments and or questions to a single panelist or to all of the panelists uh, as you wish. So let's start. Who, who would like to start this conversation off? OK, Janet, we have two people over there. Um, yeah, my question is for Lori and Jasmine. So you guys both touched upon the issue that this university has failed to accept indigenous research and indigenous research methods as a valid part of the body of knowledge that's being accumulated in this university. Um, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts are on the fact that um, in the current academic system, in order for research to be published, it's not only the home university that needs to accept it as valid, there's, there's peer research and there's the, the test and the critique of academics at other institutions. Um, how do you think that 
well, um, that issue needs to be addressed or what's the best way for uh, your research or other indigenous scholars to deal with the issue of peer review from other universities? Um, I think uh, as indigenous scholars, I think when we have other indigenous scholars to be doing our peer review, I don't see that uh, there is so much of an issue for us. Um, most uh, indigenous scholars, when we're doing our work and the work that we're doing is um, of most significance and importance for it is to be available back to their communities and um, accessible. And uh, I can speak from my personal experience in uh, uh, originally working out of the U of R in my master's program and not being able to have anybody there who could understand uh, my work. And so what the onus then was on me to go research the U of S data bank of dissertation and thesis work and to try and find other scholars, indigenous scholars who had done similar work. And uh, when that came back to the U of R, um, they actually acknowledged that they didn't know how to assess it. And so they had to outsource it to another university. And um, I think um, for an institution like this when we don't have, uh, you know, a, a group of Indigenous scholars here to be making these decisions for Indigenous students uh, and, and to help them, then I think that we need to, um, you know, look towards hiring the right people uh, in order to do that and then also supporting Indigenous scholars. If we're inviting them here because they're Indigenous scholars, then we need to be um, providing the resources so that they can access the mentors and scholars, Indigenous scholars that they need and supporting them in doing so. I think it's important to, to recognize that there are all kinds of things that are happening that you may not be mindful of or recognize as happening out there. So there are Indigenous scholars that support one another. Um, there are now Indigenous-run uh, conferences. Uh, there are uh, journals, so academic journals. So things are happening, they just, it, it, you just may not be aware of them. And I think at Waterloo, we've got a long, long way to go uh, in both encouraging that kind of research to be acknowledged as research. I, I keep you know, shifting those sorts of things and not just um, activist, um, that it needs to be understood to be scholarly production. Um, and I think that's part of what scholars like Lori and others have already, are already in, in, in the process of doing. And so we need to recognize that there is agency here. It's not like it's just not just a story of, you know, victimization. There are people who've taken control of this, even as the universities are way behind on it. So I just wanted to bring in that. Okay, I, thank sorry, you. can I add one more thing on that? Actually, um, one thing that uh, I did notice here is, as I've been taking up some uh, having Indigenous research assistants. And uh, I had one of them trying to find something for me, an article that is like very common and well known amongst indigenous scholars. And I'm like, and she's like, I can't find it. I'm like, how come you can't find it? Like, just go to the library and find it. And, uh, and then um, she kept coming back and saying she couldn't find it. And so then I started looking and realized that our actual library doesn't have access to some, like uh, has not prioritized indigenous scholarship in, in some of the journals that we're publishing in so that um, and that's uh, you know a problem for any student who you know who's trying to take up this work and, and has an interest. And um, I will say we have spoken with the library and, and are looking at sort of expanding some of this list, and it is uh, being looked at. But um, I don't know that it was known until now. Okay, excellent question. <clears throat> and we have another question over here. Yeah, thanks Colin. very much. Uh, well, it's uh, it's and my question is based on a comment by Lori, but it's uh, sort of for the whole panel. And it's related to the, the question that the gentleman just asked. Um, if, Lori, you said that uh, the indigenous research is ceremony, and there's the sense that the, um, with these clash of systems, if you will, sort of the, the university system being based on basically kind of an enlightenment view of, of, of knowledge versus sort of the indigenous view, and that's causing that that criticism, say, so that the university is based in that enlightenment uh, mindset, and that when uh, criticism is exercised on uh, indigenous student work, it then comes across as an act of violence. But I guess my question is, also, how does one, what does one do in those situations? Or how does one um, um, uh, make sure that indigenous student work is, is, uh, is being you know, valued and accepted, while at the same time um, 
acknowledging that there's, you know, there's going to be more non-Indigenous faculty members than Indigenous at this university or any university probably, and that there's going to be a lot of people are are really, you know, connected to their their understanding of scholarship and research and and how to and, and knowledge production generally. So I'm, I'm really curious about how. Uh, how would you, or anyone on the panel, how would you approach that situation if you feel that there is that kind of a, a culture clash, for lack of a better, better term? Thank you. Um, I would say that, uh, one, be honest. If we don't want to take up our le own learning and be accountable for understanding Indigenous scholarship, then don't invite Indigenous students to the university and into our programs. And uh, second of all, I would say then, um, I think the colleagues that are up here on the panel with me, I would say, have very quite actively um, engaged in reading Indigenous scholarship and engaging at a, you know, a very um, meaningful level with Indigenous peoples and communities. And, um, and then I, and I guess just back to being honest, if that's not uh, something that a, a faculty member or faculty or department is willing to do, then we need to be honest about that because otherwise Indigenous students will come here um, thinking that that might be a possibility. And uh, if we're not clear on that, we are only setting them up for failure and, and, uh, and not to be successful. Okay, thank you. Other panelists, would you like to chime in on this? Um, sure, I just wanted to say also that there's not one kind of Indigenous methodology or scholarship that Indigenous methodologies emerge out of those community contexts and those cultural Re, tra tra traditions of research as well and priorities. So, you know, Indigenous students coming to Waterloo come from a number of different perspectives as well and a number of different places. And um, we also have the issue of disciplinary context as well. So they're come, you know, we have students coming into the history department with specific expectations about what that means. History is going, students, you know, going into environment and political science. So. I think it's something that we're constantly learning and negotiating as well, and that there also is, as Jasmine was mentioning, an, uh, a, a beginning of a recognition or a better understanding of different ways of doing res research, but different ways of presenting and formatting research as well that have impact in communities and for those students' lives and futures as well. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question or comment? We have time for one or possibly two more. Yes? Um, I just, I wanted to add on to this interesting discussion, something else that, uh, like a comment that I might have too. I'm thinking back on how hard it was for qualitative re research to make its mark and be considered credible. And it, and it took time, but understanding that there is a framework that you can refer to, or that was, has been developed to show credibility, truthfulness, and um, the documentation that is there, if it can be proved, it's actually through the ethics board quite often that some of this research gets approved first and needs um, the backing of, the, of its credibility. And I, I, I know a little bit about Lori's background and how it took so many years. There was a lot of time passed just trying to get the ethics passed because it was no one on the ethics board that knew anything about Indigenous research. And, and after having been rejected, finally um, the proposal was sent around and there was someone found it. And, and it was really because they honestly admitted it's not really that we're rejecting it, it's just we don't understand it. And finding someone who understood it, um, sending it to the ethics at, the, at a different university in Saskatchewan made it possible. And now, and now that's changed at that university, the University of Regina. So I think it's, it, it's not that Indigenous research really isn't credible. It's maybe some people have some ideas that it might not be, but, but it is, and it can be proven. You just need... Someone, I, I think maybe someone on the ethics board would be helpful to make that, that link, as well as more professors and uh, other students. So I just, I can't help but go back to qualitative research and the path that it took, but now uh, it's, it's widely accepted. So I think, um, thank you for that question. 
I think the Office of Research Ethics here, there are certain people who are actually more open to and who can appreciate what it is that, that, that the challenges are for Indigenous researchers and for th those researchers who are entering into and working alongside uh, Indigenous communities and Indigenous peoples and leaders and activists, et cetera. Um, what I think is also the problem is that the way in which the TCPS2, I think it is, the way that's framed, it frames indigenous communities as other, like this other place that you enter into with these other people who are strange to us and who need to be protected in particular ways. And it's a really problematic framework. And you know, when you've got an indigenous student applying through the ORE for permission to work in their own community, you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. So even the way that the system has been set up, it assumes an, a privileged white male uh, researcher is entering into some other community that is somehow remote or something, I'm not quite sure what, that needs to be protected in particular ways. And I'm not saying that the ORE process should be you know, tossed out, but um, not only do we need indigenous scholars in there, but we need people who are much more open-minded about what exactly goes on in those relationships and that probably in some cases need to assume that these are collaborative processes rather than you know one person entering in and then leaving you know that kind of thing so even that process itself i think needs to be rethought through in, in part because of what it is that we're learning through collaborative research but also feminist research you know okay so Man, Dan, do you want to wait um, on this? just a couple points on the last two questions i mean just first a note on ethics uh, um, we do need more people in the office, I think, that understand this kind of work, uh, definitely, and we definitely need some Indigenous faculty members here or more, build up a bit of a critical mass. Um, but the, the piece on the, uh, the ethics, uh, years ago when we were working in Fort Albany, um, I mean, even just really simple things like uh, consent forms, uh, you know, it's just like written consent. I, I, I went back to the folks in ethics and said, listen, I'm a white guy coming in from the south, and I'm asking them to sign something. And an elder looked at me in the face and jokingly said, yeah, white guy coming here, getting us to sign something. We've been there before, you know? Uh, now, he kind of pushed it back in a joking way, but he was also making a statement, you know? This is not the way we're going to do things. And so I was like, OK. So I went back to the ethics folks, and I just said this is the case. And they were fine. So we, we then got permission to use oral consent. But it was, you know, sort of working in the interstitial interstitials. And, and I think there's people there that understand, but more of them with, that are open-minded. Uh, there are other universities that colleagues of mine have been at that that was just no way that was going to happen. So, you know, I think there's a long way to go, but I think there's openness. The other thing I was just going to say, just I have had the privilege of working with a number of uh, Anishinaabe um, s scholars here at the master's and, and PhD level. Uh, I think naively, I thought because, you know, there wasn't, m you know, much here that it was kind of a carte blanche, uh, kind of a blank slate. Uh, but I think that actually looking at the system through their eyes, it's uh, in the literature they often t talk about a sea of whiteness. This is a, you know, this is, it's not a friendly environment for them. And I, you know, I'm in some ways re regret inviting them, but at the same time, I think it's, they're, 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 they're all very strong Anishinaabe, Kwe, uh, very intimidating, powerful people. And so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I fear more for the university than I do them. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I do find is that what we ask of them is not only to, you know, embark on a PhD in a very, you know, my colleague and PhD student, uh, Melanie Goodchild, refers to places like this as PWIs, predominantly white institutions. Um, you know, not only do we require them to follow our sort of, you know, modern Western, um, you know, quasi-positivistic kind of, you know, research paradigm and program and learning about linked social and ecological systems, which is sort of an anathema to, to her because it's like, well, how, why do you separate them in the first place? Um, but, and, you know, in Brazilians thinking and complexity, it's like, wow, this is a big revelation. They're connected. It's like, <laughs> sorry, what? Um, but. We're asking them to essentially do double the work in a PhD. Not only do they have to fulfill our requirements, but they also have to work with their communities and their elders, which if you've ever had the privilege of working with an elder, many of these people, not all, I mean, there are elders and then there are elders, and the latter, I mean, they are like people that have like 
multiple PhDs in their world, right? Many PhDs. These are incredibly wise, well, you know, again, talking to them about linked social and ecological systems. They know more about the ecology and the ecosystem, and although they wouldn't refer it to that, they would refer it to their, their relatives, uh, than, I, than I think any of my colleagues that, you know, are, are ecologists will ever know, uh, just from a different, completely different paradigm. We are asking these people, these um, again, very capable and powerful people to come in and do our PhD, but then do a second PhD, essentially. And then we wonder why it takes so long, and then we wonder why it's so difficult. Um, so one of the things that we can just start to do in a place like this is acknowledge that and just say, listen, we understand that you know, you're going to have to go and work with your elders and be out on the land for part of this time. It's going to take longer. That's fine. You know, you're going to do the classroom work. You're going to go through the, the uh, the usual, you know, unpleasantness of a comprehensive exam, and uh, but then you're also going to have to go and spend time with your elders, and it's going to take longer. There are different requirements, and you know what? We might even have the defense out on the land and require that you know people like me leave the safety of our ivory tower and go out there, and, and a bit of reciprocity in that regard just because we're asking so much of them. So I think that just beginning to acknowledge that is a start. And I think, again, if we had more Indigenous faculty members, we would have more voices in the room other than Lori and Kelly saying, what are you guys doing, you know? Anyway, well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Dan. Well, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, I think we are going to have to bring this uh, event to a close. I sense there are a number of other questions and comments that uh, you would like to put to our panelists, but unfortunately, we're going to have to leave that for another day. So please join me, if you would please, in a round of applause for our panelists. So I just want to say, Nyawagoa, thank you very much for um, the beautiful panel up here and all your great words and, you know, raising issues and concerns and, you know, dialogue that's important because this country is in a state, a very big state of transition. With the release of the Truth and Reconciliation in June 2015, um, you know, we're in a whole big different ball game than what we're used to, right? Um, and that goes for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. So um, I think these conversations can be very challenging and very uncomfortable, but I also believe they're very necessary for the times we're in. So I just want to say um, thank you all for coming. And I just wanted to do a short closing again. I just want to keep repeating this many millions of times so that everybody at University of Waterloo starts to say it as well. Is Nyawagoa, Sangwa, Indiso, Sangwa, Wigan, Yohonyo. Nyawagoa.